so good morning everybody. I'm not going to repeat myself, but uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce and the, the first uh, day of City Debates 2018, Architecture as Urbanism and Agenda for the New Millennium. So this first panel is entitled The Social Agenda, and then we'll discuss the relationship of architecture to social space. And uh, we have three presentations. We start with uh, Carole Lévesque from the School of Design at the University of Quebec who will uh, uh, talk to us about places of the everyday. We move to uh, the presentation by Ralph Pazel Crotheim, is it correct? What I Apologies. From um, the Institute for Architecture at TU Berlin and Pazel Kunzel Architects uh, in Rotterdam, who will discuss situational urbanism and post uh, in modernist cities. And uh, the third presentation will be by Ayham Dalal, Habitat Unit TU Berlin as well, who will talk about uh, uh, refugee spaces and uh, um, interve spatial intervention and architectural interventions in them. So um, we will have the three presentation after each other and then we will have a discussion so please stay with us till the end to uh, to uh, for your questions comments and feedback we look forward to these discussions they're very important to all of us um, i will not present the uh, the uh, uh, con the presenters the paper givers more than i did you have the biographies with you they're online too so you can read the de their details their very rich trajectories and experiences professionally and uh, academically. Uh, so without further ado, I will give the floor to Carole Lévesque. Join me in welcoming all three of them. Thank you very much for being with us, coming from long distances and uh, medium distances. It's uh, always a pleasure to host uh, colleagues we'd like to meet, we met, we uh, are seeing again a forum that has become a landmark event and a meeting uh, venue for uh, academics, scholars, practitioners. So, uh, Carole, you have uh, 30 minutes. I'll police you a little bit at, at the end just to make sure we have time for okay. discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being there for the first presentation. It's usually the emptiest room when we start. It was nice to see. Um, everyone, is that working fine? Okay. Um, thank you, Robert, for inviting me to City Debates this year. It's been a long time since I've been at AUB, so it's nice to see some familiar faces again. Uh, but since I have 30 minutes and someone policing me, <laughs> I'll uh, go right away into the lecture. Um, so temporary construction uh, resides in the gray zone with, within the practice of architecture. By its nature, it disputes the dominant, dominant role we attribute to the discipline that is the promise of a permanent and definitive solution. In the present context where the social, economical, ecological and more largely ethical impacts of large urban renewal projects are often questionable, small temporary architecture allows to explore larger preoccupations through a direct engagement with the city and with its inhabitants, all the while proposing that alternatives may be possible. As a prospective method of conception within which provocative ideas take precedence over problem solving, small interventions enlarge the spectrum of what is plausible, all the while being an active participant in the thinking and the making of the city. History shows us <coughs> that small-scale temporary architecture was, for a long time, a means to move away from a given situation to propose an alternative reality by transforming the space of the city, to provoke change in the ways we consider realities linked to the urban or the larger territory, or again in our ways of interacting with each other, such as what we see here, a painting by Mashi about uh, when Soufflot met the king of France to convince him of the benefit the city would, uh, would gain by building saint Geneviève Church that will become the Pantheon de Paris. This is a model. This is made of uh, wood and canvas. It's not the real building. As early as the 18th century, temporary construction was used to transform cities to provoke change in the ways by which the city was developed at a time when the idea of public space was beginning to form. Here what we have is the bride entering Vienna and you see the arch on the left but there's another one to the upper right corner and the idea of these temporary machines um, were to obviously 
uh, add some kind of grandiosity to the procession, but also to test how the city could develop, how we could manage the crowd within the, uh, the eventual streets, and how we could imagine the city that has yet to be built. Or in this image here with the illuminations at night, where we could redraw the city, test new alignments, see how we could further perspectives or axes. So temporary architecture was used to really uh, test different city developments during the festivities. But if temporary architecture shares the history of permanent architecture, it was and still is considered as a marginal practice, possibly because it can exist without predetermined function, because it is free to suggest use rather than being governed by it, and because it can exist on sites inaccessible to permanent constructions. It's also thought differently. Particular tectonics are usually developed for it, tectonics that are not always tributary to what would be usually qualified as adequate construction, using a language, a rhetoric, a provocative stance, materials and assemblies that don't always find a direct echo in normative practice. Temporary architecture thus distinguishes itself because it operates outside of predetermined functions and because it is interested in the effects it produces, in the questions it raises, and in the possibilities it sets in place, more so than the functional and organizational demonstration of its know-how. So contrary to what, might be, what we might be led to think when we look around the recent practice of temporary architecture, or perhaps more precisely the practice of event design that has grown over the past two decades, temporary architecture isn't exclusive to festivities or rejoicings, nor is it necessarily linked to public efforts of urban cleansing, as it is now often the case, at least in Montreal. Small-scale temporary architecture can also act as means to have a better understanding of specific place and situations as, part, as if part of a documentation process. There's a phone ringing. Documentation refers, of course, to the idea of making and of inventory, but it also pertains to the realm of witnessing, of teaching, and of establishing proof. So to me, temporary architecture becomes worthwhile when thinking of its capacity to translate into built form urban conditions to better understand them, to question their context and give sense to this knowledge as it is forming. I seek through my work to consider temporary interventions as one of many tools with which to reveal characteristics of everyday places and to support an active and critical participation in the everyday within dominant discourses imposed on the contemporary city. When I first came to Lebanon, to live in Lebanon back in 2009, it's been almost 10 years now, um, with my, newly, my then newly acquired PhD in which I had focused my research on the purpose of uselessness in architectural practice, it seemed that one could build temporary interventions just about anywhere as there were so many ruins still left around Beirut and I thought that Beirut would be a great terrain of in investigation. But the intricate web of social, economic and political relations that govern how the city is organized um, and thought about seemed too entangled to let one ask, act as one would wish. So while there was, and I am sure still is, a good practice of activism amongst designers, building didn't seem to me the most urgent need. What seemed most urgent was rather to understand why some pockets of the city, despite their centrality, were kept outside both of the main academic discourses and outside the experience of the city. I began to wonder why that was, and if the meeting of temporary small-scale architecture and these neglected neighborhoods could perhaps bring them out of their general disregard. So as I go through the rest of the presentation, I would ask you to keep in mind that there's always a double side to things. In terms of the urban, we might say that there is the city of the conqueror and the city of the dweller. While most cities, and not just Beirut, are quickly developed under neoliberal forces and massive real estate speculation, leaving li little room for alternatives, there always remain a place for possibilities of action. 
So let's begin by looking at why we should pay attention to things that we say are banal. Two things. First, if we go to see what Marx said about the everyday, we find that everything is accompanied by its contrary. Good things are inextricably linked to bad ones, and conversely, bad things contain the seeds of the good. Marx thought that the possibility of change was rooted in these contradictions, within the dialectic of incompatible elements and realities. For him, cities had this bizarre characteristic of being pregnant with their contrary, finding freedom in overwhelming situations, laughter through misery, possibilities in the impossible. Secondly, though in the same vein, Henri Lefebvre claimed that everyday life is the realm of meaningful social resistance, and it is by looking into the small and apparently irrelevant details of the everyday that one might be able to understand the larger structures in play. More so, Lefebvre thought that the creation of an ideal community could only be pursued through the study of everyday life in everyday urban settings. He believed that the city of tomorrow could be built of the dreams of today if only architects and urban planners, that is most of us in this room today, could appreciate the significations, indication, and auguries perceived and lived by those who inhabit the real or what we could easily qualify as banal. Interestingly, the etymology of the word banal supports the claim to find purpose, value, and the coming together of a people within the city rather than a simplistic waste of time. Indeed, in medieval France, every time a village was founded, two things would be built, a chapel and a bread oven. These two constructions played a central role in establishing a community. Finding its root in the feudal system, a banc, designated the public, that is, all those, thing, all those who together form a people submitted to the same law. It also meant the extent of land to which a given lord had the power to make the law, thus giving the meaning to banlieue, literally designating the land within about a mile around and within whose limits extended the authority of the jurisdiction. A banalité was equivalent to a tax paid by the villagers to the lord of the land so that they could make use of the things said banal, that is, those things destined to public use, such as bread ovens. In medieval French, banel meant literally communal. The word grew from open to everyone to that which is at the disposition to all, to commonplace, ordinary, and petty, to finally evolve to our current understanding of banal as of no interest. But up to the 18th century, things described as banal carried with them a positive sense of community, of worth, and of what made life possible. The medieval meaning of banal helps us see that the things of the everyday are not insignificant. Rather, they are perhaps the site of a possible community of meaning and value. Banal things, banal events, banal places, and banal people might very well be the stronghold of what truly characterizes the experience of the city. Areas about to undergo major urban renovation are examples of where the right of the city is in dire straits and offered, often threatened. While some of these areas might be empty and carry the definition of vacant land, there remains a group of areas in which communities live and sometimes thrive but which, for various reasons, have remained on the margins of the idea of the ideal city. The contribution of Ignacy de Sola Morales, published in Any Place in 1995, has become central to the exploration of abandonment in architecture, urban design, and the arts, as he coined the term <coughs> terrain vague, a term now largely used to speak of the derelict. Reflecting on the tradition of photography as a mediator of representation, he wondered why, since the 1970s, urban photographers had inaugurated a new sensibility, perhaps even a fascination, for derelict spaces in the urban. Photographic images of the terrain vague, he argued, are territorial indications of strangeness itself, and the aesthetic and the ethical problems that they pose embrace the problematic of contemporary life. If Sola Morales spoke of the terrain vague with a positive fascination, 
His discourse followed an incompatible parallel with that of the promotion of urban renewal and of the desire of an aesthetics of righteousness. While the Terre Vague is most often understood as a singular space or a succession of a few accumulated lots, certain cities, and Beirut is one of them, hold within their fabric large urban areas that, though inhabited by vibrant communities, can still be understood as abandoned. While these areas have an established historical presence, their abandonment suspends not so much their use as their participation in the city's development. In other words, these areas, sorry, these areas are a form of inhabited terrain vague, or what I propose to call a vague urbain. What the vague urbain contributes to our experience of the city is the opportunity to move away from homogeneity and from the elimination of existing differences and peculiarities, to rather be forced to accept and work with difference. But the assimilation of the vague urbain into our idea of what a city should be isn't easily achieved. Though the recognition of the vague urbain is not a question of aesthetics, Efforts have to be made to render its qualities, its value, and its presence within the city as a worthy component of the urban. For the vague urbain to exist in the cultural imagination, it needs to be represented and shown as a valuable scape. But as is the case with every opportunity, our desires to intervene is great and our efforts to fill in the gaps is grand. The difficulty poses itself thus. Either we neglect the vague urbain and leave it to be transformed by major renovation, or we accept it as it is at the risk of placing it under a glass dome, so to speak, keeping ourselves exterior to it and gazing upon it as a spectacle. The challenge really lies in our ability to find ways to both help it and keep it, to learn from it and with it but mostly to take the time required to practice it in order to be able to bear and prolong the lessons learned. Without overwhelming the vague urbain with architectural and other well-intentioned urban design interventions, <coughs> attending to the vague urbain means that we build genuine representations of it, allowing it into our perception of what an urban landscape can include so that it may participate in our idea of the ideal city. So I would like to share with you a project I worked on for a few years and that will soon, this fall, come into the form of a book. I'm really excited and I need Robert's approval before I go back to Montreal for his comment. Um, anyway, I'm really excited about this. Uh, and it's a book um, in which temporary architecture played the role of documentation. But before I move on to the project itself, I would like to outline something about Beirut that seems to me essential and goes back to what I ask you to keep in mind in the beginning of the presentation. Since the 19th century, when the city was expanding from its intramural center and that various infrastructures were put in place, changes in the <coughs> legislation overseeing urban growth brought profound transformations to the production of the city perhaps the most important one being the introduction of eminent domain. These various laws that are generally called tanzimat, I'm sorry for the French pronunciation of the word, uh, made possible a top-down development of the city. But in the midst of urban growth and efforts of modernizing the city, there remained nonetheless a certain balance between the planned and the informal, organized facades and streets behind which could be found shops, sheds, various forms of tenements and the likes. The story of Beirut had been, at least in my understanding, until the most recent con con reconstruction, one of a dual dialectic development, one development pushed forward by the desire of those in power for a well-organized and functioning city, the other sustained by the means, needs and desires of its inhabitants. The various expansion episodes had all been, until now, characterized by the conquest of the modern by the vernacular and of the ordered by the informal. When I first encountered um, Bashura, this dialectics was most evident. Secluded from the rapid reconstruction, it appeared as one of the few remaining places in central Beirut where an alternative discourse to the crushing speculation might still be formulated. 
because Bashura stands next to Solidaire, it showed with crystal clarity the dualities of Beirut, dualities engaged between the city of the conqueror and the city of the dweller. If Bashura was clearly not a space offered to spontaneous appropriation due mainly to its political affiliations which trigger more often than not suspicion and surveillance, its practices as strange or as banal as they appeared revealed a Beirut that was still rooted in its traditions, a practice of Beirut that was still able to manage informality within the formal, and a proposal for a Beirut that still welcomed the presence of spontaneity, awkwardness, and inventiveness as bearers of city-making. It also provided to whoever would be willing to spend enough time and pay sufficient attention a space from which to reflect upon the city's trajectory. So through the documentation, I sought to capture some of the details that build and gave sense to the neighborhood. A creative documentation that presents non-official stories while posing a sincere and conscientious attention to a place that seemed, a priori, useless and disposable. Through the interpretation and telling of practices, that were not otherwise represented or that were devalued by dominant discourses, the work proposes that this vague bank contained, and I suspect still does, a marvelous reel that is necessary for the well-being of the city and for escaping a one-way urbanization. The project combines a photographic documentation, textual descriptions, and two series of drawings. From the documentation and description of found places and situations, five nomadic and transitory personal infrastructures were elaborated. Each manifests three essential practices of Bashura, the practice of storytelling, the practice of wandering, and the practice of gleaning. The personal infrastructures stem from found situations and events and become as they belong to soon to disappear people, places, buildings, and practices, invented rooms without definite location, pushed, rolled, pulled, swung, and carried through the new city as nomadic personal vague urbain. So starting with the systematic documentation recording shops and empty lots, as you see here, or uses of parking spaces, drying laundry, children at play or at work, men occupying sidewalks, green spaces, passages and artistic interventions, as you saw in the previous slides, and followed by photographic photo collages rendering movement in important locations, the photographic documentation is meant to evoke the effective dimension of Bashura and capture its banalities. While most practices found on the streets of Bashura are repeated over time, the rhythm in which they appear isn't always clear, hence the necessity of going often at various times of day on various days. While it is common for architects and urban designers to collage photos when wanting to have a full image of a site or a building, often much larger than what the lens will allow to take, the photo collages were done in a much more fluid manner with the camera placed at a different angle for every shot in order to create a dynamism in the photography that simulates to some extent the dynamism implied in walking through the different sites. So the drawing of the personal infra infrastructures of the rooms, to put it more simply, transcribed in their own architectural language the situational time, spaces, narratives, and practices of Bashura. For instance, um, children playing hide and seek in an abandoned building located in the midst of an impromptu garden becomes a room for hiding in the shadows of a room, an infrastructure to carry shadows with you no matter the time of day or night. In it, thousands of silky threads embody the shadow so one may feel the warmth and softness shade provides in the depths of a hot afternoon. Men, sitting on their, um, men spending most of their day sitting on plastic chairs, smoking argili and drinking coffee, becomes a room for keeping distractions away, an infrastructure to keep you both in movement and in the same space. So as one balances on the swing, a reversed gear uh, rolls the machine in the opposite direction so that though you're flying through space, you're really remaining in the same location. 
Confusion about wanting to give unnecessary directions becomes a room for going where you don't need to be. An infrastructure that is so large and heavy, it is practically impossible to move up a street. Yet the infrastructure's purpose is to carry a watchtower, so when lost or uncertain of where to go, one lifts it up and climbs the stairs so as to see further in the preferred direction. But by the time one climbs down the spiral, turns the infrastructure back on its side and pushes it hard enough to make it roll again, well, directions are probably again lost and the infrastructure will lead the way towards where one most likely didn't need to go. An old woman, proud of her one-room apartment containing a complete life story, becomes a room for sharing essential things, a half-dome structure as a woven basket one carries on one's back. So when wandering about the city and encountering another carrier of essential things, both carriers can put their half-dome down and turn and form a complete structure in which essential things, essential words or practices can be shared. And finally, the incredible story of a prime minister who sent his men to tear up the sidewalks in Bashura in order to build a villa in the desert using the stones from the sidewalk becomes a room for carrying stones, an empty wall structure that is pushed around the city in order to collect stones or broken concrete. As the pieces are collected, the infrastructure becomes heavier, eventually too heavy to be pushed any further. So its content is emptied out to allow the structure to be pushed again, leaving behind a pile of traveled stones. So even if these rooms seem improbable, the representation of found situations proposes the integration of the everyday in our urban experience and embed the banal within cultural traits, spatial specificities, everyday habits, and local history. They are presented in orthogonal projection, projections, so they build a dialogue between the informality of a personification of knowledge with the neutral communication of architectural drawings. In this way, the drawings introduce the informality of the vague urbain as a silent reality of our cities into a scholarly discourse of architecture and the cities that it helps building. The strangeness of the infrastructures and situations from which they emerge are themselves associated through the architectural drawing with disciplinary know-hows. The second series of drawings places the rooms in a Beruti context as, the, as if they had been built and left to lead a life of their own. The landscapes are half invented in that they are drawn from strong images of Beirut but do not depict definitive and precise places. As such, and as with the room drawings, each landscape clearly belongs to the city even if one is in fact in, incapable of identifying a precise location represented like a facade that is drawn in two dimensions rather than in perspective. The landscapes are drawn using standard drawing techniques as an architect would employ for drawing an elevation. And like the elevation which demonstrates how a given imagined building will act upon its surroundings and <coughs> contribute to the developing context, so these landscapes simultaneously real and invented convey their ability to transform our outlook and steer our attention as we apprehend the cityscape. So all of these architectural machines and landscape, along with the photographic investigation, are part of a documentation process which seeks to better understand places such as Bashura and render visible the hidden narratives that form a community and that eventually shapes a city. And to me, well, this is where architectural, uh, temporary small-scale architecture might be the most useful. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, for an introduction to my lecture that I will not ever be able to do myself. <laughs> that was very handy, actually. Um, in order to allow me to jump into um, two projects I brought with me that are a bit more project oriented in the sense that their um, academic um, weight is not going to be the core of this conference. Actually, to put the pressure back time-wise on you, um, 
my lecture was prepared for an hour, so uh, I only have half an hour. It will be over when you tell me it's over. Okay? So, um, oh my God, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> okay, I, I'll just talk a bit faster then. It'll be okay. Um, as a practicing architect and uh, also uh, as a professor for architectural design and construction, um, our work centers very, very often and very crucially and importantly about the question of what we would call the open city. A city that in one or the other way has a certain understanding of collective values that are very often, at least in the European context, um, well, not there or not present in these projects because of uh, any sorts of forces and strength and compels that are within the project structure. Um, so what we are dealing with very often is the question how we can actually design strategies rather than an end product, an image that we are all after. So we're not so much interested in that final image, we're more interested into this mechanism, how the city can be managed or actually um, uh, negotiated. And as you know much better than I do, cities in crisis, whatever the crisis uh, had been, offer a sort of a laboratory field, a, a breeding ground for an experiment that goes maybe beyond the usual top-down planning methodologies. They offer, at least to us, a very strong potential to derive to a new awareness, awareness of the social coherence within the urban society. However, since my passion is practicing as an architect, my interest is clearly in the transition to actually bring the theoretical and research-based structure into the reality of being. So this transitioning act is always the motivation and the engine where all our projects are based on. In that respect, there is actually a very strong link between my chair at the university and the research we're doing there and the work we do in our office, not meaning that we're working on the same projects, but we're testing out ideas, we're testing out strategy, that one informs the other and vice versa. So we actually, we try to merge these boundaries into a being that for us makes absolute sense and adds more to the, the addition of one and one. The first project I'm going to um, uh, project you into is uh, published in that book. I brought here, you may have a look later and reading tonight if you want, in case uh, I'm missing out some important details in these 30 minutes. But it is shortly said about designing coexistence in a structure in a country, the Netherlands, which is highly relied, which highly relies on planning, planification methods. In the Netherlands, you may know, we all live 10 to 20 meters below sea level we have a very common understanding of a consensus of consensus policies and also we have um, the threat that if we don't agree on something as a society we will not be there in a couple of years anymore so this puts a sort of pressure on everything we do and as long as the economy runs as it runs now and, and it used to run in the past years almost all the time um, there's no problem. But in 2008 and 2009, the country was hit by an economi economic crisis, the first and worst one since the Second World War, that puts everything upside down. And that puts a big question mark behind this big project developments in the sense of infrastructure with respect to um, all sorts of spatial developments, urban developments, planning realities. Um, just, that's just to sketch the background, the background of the project. All of a sudden, we all that are used and so confident about our planning tools didn't know what to do anymore. 
So there's, there was this void and this vacuum which we had to fill. And we got an, a commission by the city of Utrecht, which is the third biggest city in the Netherlands, to come up with a strategy that at least the precarious areas in the city could be somehow worked with any further, even though we don't have the means to do so. So we started off redefining our partners and our stakeholders to find actually parties, communities, entities that we could literally work with in a co-productive process. So this um, search, if not to say research, about what is actually there in place got us to know a lot of different activities, practices, but mainly also people that are living in the area, in the neighborhood, that are able, if they are moderated in a, let's say, perfect way, to contribute something to urban planning that is not a top-down strategy, but there's also not a bottom-up strategy, that is something that is guided by set, a set rule of, a set frame of rules, but also allows a lot of freedom maneuvering within. Um, why is that important? Maybe it's a cultural thing, but it is important because scales are related, even though you cannot transform one strategy from one scale to the other, as uh, Dana told uh, us yesterday, and I totally agree on that actually, but um, the scales are clearly independent of each other. So whatever we do on the big scale has an effect on the, on the small scale and vice versa. According to the credo, there's no urbanism without detail and no detail without urbanism. No, that is really um, what's happening here. So we kind of try to operate on, on every scale and try to understand what is actually the core that is inhabiting the spatial structure we find in place and how can we actually develop an architectural vocabulary that would allow us working in that neighborhood with situative interventions that on one side have a maximum impact on the public realm, on public space, and on the other side enhance the living conditions of the people, of the residents living in that, in that neighborhood. That is the neighborhood as it presented itself during the time it was built. Clearly, the modern thinking, the ideals of modernism, um, you all uh, know these images, serial housing production after the Second World War, in just a short period of time in that area, they built a city in itself, a neighborhood which houses today uh, 70,000 people. Um, there are various other neighborhoods, all more or less the same scale, just like um, crashed out of the ground, basically, and uh, build up in a very short amount of time. This is how it's presenting itself today. So looking at it from a landscape point of view, you think, well, the trees grew, that's good, and so on. Looking at it from a social point of view, it's uh, a bit scary the way that the, the anonymity of the place is increasing by what's interesting to see or what we found out a programmatic change that has been taking place within the buildings itself. So the buildings, which you clearly recognize as residential buildings, they are also residential buildings, but not only residential buildings anymore. They have many, many other programs. They have um, a dentist on the ninth floor. They have a little uh, kiosk on the 13th floor. They have a little bakery on the third floor. And if you don't know the place, you will never ever find it. So you have to know your neighbor or have to get the rumor that something has changed somewhere in the building or in the neighboring building or in the neighboring building. They all look the same, more or less, you know, in order to live an urban life, which puts things in a way upside down, but also um, which offers to us a huge potential to work with these people in a very situative context, in a system that was moderated throughout years, where people, stakeholders, came together in collective meetings and things were discussed and interventions were talked through and actually, um, at least content-wise, designed. So just to give you an example, 
uh, that just uh, some some little things um, here like uh, the the ground floor area is is always in these neighborhoods of uh, special a, a special issue uh, to address a special potential but also a special problem now if you if you uh, look at the situation here there's no interaction between the building and the public realm um, which actually makes four backyard facades to a building that has four front facades um, so how can you get how can you work with that with that twist and along these lines oh, there there it is no I mean, you would not imagine that this black hole in the middle, and all we added was red paint to highlight it a bit, is actually the main entrance to a building that houses a couple of hundred people. No? It's not only appalling, it's ridiculous, to be honest, speaking from an urban point of view. Um, so that offers a big potential by its very nature, and other things uh, did it well. For example, that a survey we did, found, we found out that about 600 companies within these residential buildings were urgently needing looking for a commercial space where they could actually practice their business or their practices no so there's also a spatial lack um, that is sort of accompanied to the to these conditions one of the biggest challenges however stayed and still is the situation that I would call or describe with the word trust in a way. Um, as an architect, planner, you're in between chairs. You're the Dutch say between the boat and the dike. No, you do the volunteer. And the one is <coughs> mistrusting you and the other one as well. So how can you work in that in that condition? And the idea we had, and it turned out to be a very good tool in order to communicate about things, is to try to make a drawing, which is a, a, a required thing to do in these projects, in a way that it would rather address different issues than the ones you would expect. So rather than drawing project implementations into a drawing, we would try to draw certain fields of forces like of magnetic fields that had a potential to actually transform the neighborhood into something um, different. And these, um, it's almost like a meteorological map which has like high pressure areas and low pressure areas and it it's actually shows a little bit more the dynamics of it. These areas, they would also indicate like the potential or where we as the group saw the biggest potential in okay if we intervene here we may have the biggest impact on whatever we do so from this localization of the first interventions that could be done by a community by themselves once they were provided with one empty space um, for example or when they just grab a part of the public realm or of the green area just to start something in, to kick the project off, let's say, this time, which we kind of uh, considered about up to three years, would then be followed by a densification scenario. Now, the densification scenario is actually building up onto the, this consolidated interventions by, ne by now, or by at the time then it was in the future. But, um, and from that point of view, it, there's a sort of inner logic to the project that made you invest in something which is not a big building, or not a big structure, but it's just like one community or one business could afford by themselves. So also there, there's a property change involved in the whole thing, which is part of this singular owned um, city quarter um, that allowed people to actually um, buy their properties um, according to the, the businesses they, they do. The third phase then would be a sort of a payback phase. Uh, we always call that as a working title, the facilitating phase, which then would reinvest into the infrastructural issues going on in that neighborhood. And so layer by layer of by layer come together in order to um, work on a plan that is clearly a top-down issue, but without having the means it comes out Within, within this moderated process out of this uh, community itself. Um, yeah, this, this is just like how we visualized uh, the, the impact it, it could have if you look at the 
ground floor spaces, for example. I just grabbed out one um, in order to, to give you an, an, a vague idea about what the spaces could be transformed. Now, interesting enough, when we started the study about one year later, there were the elections, and the new Minister of Housing, she kind of came up with a strategic plan to change or to actually um, work with 40 uh, precarious neighborhoods in the Netherlands. And it turned out that all 40 of them are, well, most, actually, I think 38 of them were in a, in a sort of post-war um, structure built. So this typical modernist um, uh, area. And um, the, the book we, we published about the, well, the, the proceeding within the project became a sort of a guidebook that was given away to other municipalities in order to, to, to give them a menu which they could choose different ingredients, different tools to work with. So that was quite interesting, a spin-off that wasn't planned in the beginning, but that sort of was a sort of a, a spin-off that, that came out of the project. The other one, um, before I'd be cut off probably uh, time-wise, I want to introduce you to is a totally different project in a totally different context, in a different country as well. And I'm, I chose this project because it shows, it highlights a little bit how these moderating processes can happen and how you, you, you can interact with uh, certain players in that, in that game. It's based on the, uh, the refugee streams uh, that you know uh, much better than I do from mainly Syria but also Afghanistan um, and uh, other African countries that came into Germany um, uh, 2014-15, mainly 16 as well, and which all of a sudden um, offered a huge potential, no? From our perspective. All of a sudden we had like one million people that brought in capacities, skills we could work with, um, we could establish something, we could do something together with. Um, the only problem is that um, there were no structure that would somehow allow us to participate in that. And the Home Not Shelter initiative is an initiative that, was, um, that we set up with uh, five universities with, uh, throughout Europe that were tackling the housing issue, but not from out the perspective necessarily of the, the refugees coming into the country, which was an, an evident problem housing-wise. I mean, there was not enough housing available, simply said. But the problem behind it was that actually we have badly neglected our social housing policies for 20, 30 years, and we haven't built. So um, we have found situations like these, sure you know these images as well. This is the, the, the emergency housing that were put up overnight in every school, we, in the sports centers and so on, or here in the, in the old air, uh, airport of uh, Berlin. Um, just to give you one example, precarious conditions of course, but um, a, a, a ground to actually rethink the whole um, social housing question. And clearly, what we want to avoid within this initiative is the first three uh, diagrams. What we're heading for is this inclusive model. Um, again, the inclusive model is the most complicated to realize because it's a dynamic system. There's no clear actors. The actors change permanently and so on. So how do you live together? How do you, well, make a home together? It took us a while in the, with our students to talk about this until we found out that actually the group of students we were talking to had a very similar uh, biography with the respect that about 95% of them would have left a city which was not Berlin to study, which is like far away. So they're also in this transitory status, not knowing whether they're going to stay forever or whether they go back or it's not an issue no, at this moment. So the problem, the issue is the housing situation. And I quickly flipped through some of the, the strategies we developed, like this was the conversion of a, a, a parking lot. Parking garages are numerous in Berlin. Most of them are empty, funny enough, because people tend to car park their cars on the street or they take public transport. The buildings are fully flagged, equipped with an infrastructure, fresh water access, 
electricity, and so on. So we developed in a series of workshops together with the stakeholders, with our students, that were teamed in, in groups, we de developed certain strategies that allowed us immediately to go into constructive systems, into strategies that would propose, for example, that the city builds a spatial structure, and in a moderated process, together with the future, develop with the future tenants, we then finish the building. Um, that sounds all very theoretical, quickly browse through that. There you see the parking lot again, which is just a two-layer parking deck. A waste of space for cars, to be honest. In the center of Berlin, so perfect spot you know, for social housing. Or this case, um, the transformation of empty office spaces. There's thousands and millions of square meters empty office space in Germany. Why not using it? This one then be turned into the first um, practice-based project, a temporary housing project for three years, which we realized as the first real project. And um, as you can see here, it's the old um, former Siemens headquarter in Austria, in Vienna, that had been well uh, built in the 70s in the belief that concrete solves it all. No, it's, uh, in the end of the day, it's a structure that is irremovable. Um, um, that cannot, it's not flexible, it's not, it's concrete divisioning walls, it's, uh, so it's, it's impossible to turn that into a, a housing project for students and, uh, and uh, uh, refugees as a sort of collective project where they also could actually take an active role in transforming the space. So this was our test case where together with this group of people we tried to work in these very limited office spaces take out the suspended ceiling, the risen floor in order to gain extra height. The finance system in Austria allowed us only to use seven square meter per person, which is ridiculous. Um, but anyway, there, uh, these spaces, by creating a second, a second level in this office height, allowed us to somehow have a double use of that ground. Um, and the nice thing about this was really that actually the group who was living there for three years um, are actually the ones who, who designed it, that built it, and were like, a, um, you know, actively involved in the whole process. So this is just to give you some images. Then the collective spaces are the, the uh, uh, communal spaces within the building. Um, as you think as an architect, you know, the rooms, uh, private, public spaces, they, they eat together, they cook together, they watch a movie together with this little amphitheater. Um, whatever that was installed within the building it was interesting to see that it actually turned out the other way around. That these spaces, they're big enough to actually go there and be there on your own. Because the rooms, due to this financial um, pressure that was on the development with the funding, there were all double or three triple bedrooms. So th there's no real privacy in these rooms. But in the collective spaces, so we got this flip-flop effect, you, you get the idea that there people could actually, could actually stay and use their mobile phone to connect with home or, you know, be, be a bit more private, funny enough, even though the spatial boundaries are blurry, are, are not really there. Also, the, the question of, it's all super low budget, no? So it's only a couple of hundred euros, so you find what, you, you deal with what you find in place. The suspended uh, lights, we just take out this, well, it's what you, what's left around the bulbs, if you, take, if you re remove these white panels, they fall down and they hang where they are. So this is just as found in place. The floorboards, which were removed from the, from the bedrooms, they were built into furniture pieces. And all this were accompanied by a sort of an IKEA-like manual that was given to everyone, to every three, four friends that could then just grab one project and work on that, no? follow the instructions how to do it. And um, one way or the other, it, it kind of created a situation where everyone has physically worked on this project and where everyone it was really funny because we had a sociologist going in there and asking, okay, who did this project? And there was like 150 people saying me. You know, that sort of idea, we think, yeah, 
you know, I, I like that, that idea. Obviously, building together is something forming a, a, a group of friends or a, co a community. No? So, um, what we're working on now is a project that takes it one step further. It's a new build project, a new scale, low-cost housing, a timber housing, which is technologically speaking a big issue in Germany at the moment. Um, and that kind of transforms the, the same principles into a bigger building project, let's say. Now this project is being built in a co-productive sense with building companies and the future dwellers. And the starting point of this settlement, it has more of these buildings around, but the core of it is this little, what looks like a greenhouse, this little communal space, where right now as we speak, and since the last two months actually, talks with the future residents, what do they want, what do they need, um, what can they do, what skills do they bring, uh, what is their contribution to physically actually build this building uh, in the end. And we are build, well, we, we're setting up a team of let's say builders in this space now that then during the construction time becomes the construction site office and once the construction is finished turns into their little collective room. And this is where I'm going to end because if I'm going to dive into that one which really deals with the singular groups then we can do that tonight at the bar I think it's uh <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, as the picture says, my name is Ayham. I'm a PhD student at uh, Technical University of Berlin, uh, Department of International Urbanism and Design, Habitat Unit, and I'm also a researcher at the SFA project, Architecture of Asylum which is investigating um, the, um, the production of space through um, by refugees, let's say, in, in Germany and Jordan. Um, the, the title that I have chosen for this presentation is We Refugees, We Architects, and this is building on a um, very famous text by Hannah Arendt, who wrote about the, the refugee crisis in Europe, and also followed by writings by George Agamben later, but I wanted to put this in contrast with we architects. So basically in this lecture I'm, I'm interested in exploring how societies produce spaces and produce urban, urban environment in which we live. Um, and also to question and critically question the role of architect in this, in this, um, um, in this matrix let's say, of relations. Um, to do that I will focus on Zatari camp which is in Jordan um, and I will try to draw on my experience um, in the camp that I have been working there since 2014. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to the case study to Zatari camp. Um, I'm also going to explain the urbanization of the camp. I think this is quite famous in the news that the camp has kind of evolved into uh, urban environments. So how this process of urbanization happened through homemaking. Um, and then I'm looking at the caravan as the unit, the prefab, as a unit of the, of the urban, and let's say, architectural environment of the camp, or let's say the DNA. So what kind of politics were involved in the process, what kind of economies and architecture. And finally, I'm trying to, um, to draw, um, um, let's say, um, I'm trying to draw uh, conclusions that relate to um, social groupings and cultures, so how do they impact the social agenda, what's the relationship between um, what I know in Zatari camp and the aim of this panel. So um, it's quite known, of course, that there have been more than 40 um, Palestinian refugee camps in the Middle East, and the, and the Syrian crisis since 2011 has produced um, another 39 um, uh, Syrian camps. Uh, so this is making the refugee camp as a urban element. It's very it's, it's a constituent element of the urban landscape of the Middle East, and um, that's why it's very interesting for us to study it. Um, in Jordan, Jordan is a country that has been uh, very much. Um, is influenced by the by the dynamics of migration. So they have received 
refugees since the beginning and also even Lebanese refugees during civil war. And um, in the Syrian crisis, this has resulted in the production of different camp spaces, among which Zatari um, has a pivotal position, let's say. Um, so the camp um, is on the northern borders of, of Jordan. Um, it's a very interesting space because it's, um, it has its own, you know, it's very special because it's isolated from politics, from economy. It's a place that's controlled by, I mean, the, the, the politics and economy of the state. So it's like a place where it's like mainly controlled by unit CR, governed by unit CR, where you have NGOs that, you know, operate their uh, programs in the camp and they, so the, the, the space of the camp it has this very specific environment. And I remember when I went there first time in 2014, and I was saying, OK, I'm an architect, and I want to look at the camp. And they were like, what are you doing here? Why, why, why an architect need to look at this? And this was like the beginning where the camp was like a bunch of tents and, um, um, and a few caravans. Um, so the camp. Since July 2012 till today, the camp has evolved from a size of a small village to a, whole, to a whole city. And during this process, there was something very interesting that occurred, which is this kind of, let's say, conflict that had happened between the social agendas and the humanitarian agenda. Um, and this is probably very clear when we look at December 2012. When the camp, at the beginning, of course, people were like trying to settle in the place, in the, in the small space of the camp. Um, and then UNHCR, which is the UN Higher uh, Commissioner for Refugees, uh, decided to plan the camp and say, OK, we want to um, um, introduce planning to the, to the camp. Um, interestingly, the planning of camps relies very much on this very normative um, um, let's say, criteria of how the camp should be like. So they have this very famous handbook for emergencies, which explains how the space should be created. And this, you know, this, this book has, as I said, like this kind of um, list of instruction of how to create this, how to run and, and plan the site of the camp. Um, and therefore, every family will receive, when they, when they are up to the camp, they have to receive one tent, a uh, family of five members, uh, newly, of course, a caravan. Um, also, the understanding of space is very much based on this covered space versus open space. So they have this 3.5 square meter of covered space and 45 um, square meter of open space. Um, and, and to provide services for refugees, they have to, um, to create these communal infrastructures, which are like communal kitchens where people have to go and cook, and communal latrines, unit toilets, um, and communal water tanks. And this has resulted in Zatari camp into what looks like um, a modernist kind of, um, you know, a plan. Um, it actually looks like a floor plan. You know, you have an area where, where people can sit, can, can live in these caravans in this area. You have places where people have to go for toilets. We have to, to, if you want to cook, you have to go here. It's um, very much I mean, resonates this Le Corbusier understanding of, of architecture. And it's cool that I'm saying Le Corbusier first time, and I don't have to explain who is this, because I'm always used to talk to social scientists. Um, so basically, they, they produce this kind of spaces that, that, that for, for their understanding, fits with this temporality and, the, um, as I said, this um, condition of the camp, that this is a temporal situation. However, the camp has evolved very much into what looks like today as a very complex urban environment. Um, and very interesting to observe and to study, uh, at least for myself. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit how, through my interviews, how, through, the, through the interviews that I have done with people, how this process occurred, what, what people understood of, of the camp space. So, as I said at the beginning, units are, they kind of arranged the, the tents um, in rows, and then people were like, one of the ladies was, was telling me when we first arrived, there was no phone, no, no Facebook, there was no electricity. We were disconnected. And she was very depressed. She was like telling me how like, her hair were falling. And um, it was very um, dramatic um, and traumatic, let's say, um, experience for, for many. Um, other people were like, we don't even know how to erect a tent. We don't know how to live here. So this is like a very challenging situation. So um, we used to live all the time in, in cities. Um, in, our in our house in Homs, for example. 
However, during this process, people started slowly to create their own urban infrastructure. So this guy, for example, he said, okay, I had this tent, but I also wanted to have a, you know, I wanted to live, you know, so I, so I, I, I created this small uh, space where I put the Zinco sheets and I created this small infrastructure, created the hole, and then they connected, they, he connected it with a plastic barrel, so like more like a, sewage, a small sewage system, let's say, very primitive one. Um, however, as I said, um, the intervention of the, of the Gulf countries, let's say pro mainly Saudi donors, they started this process of saying, okay, uh, because of the tents, the, the tents were collapsing because of the rain and the, and the heavy snow at some point. So they were like substituting all the tents with caravans. So Saudis donated many caravans. Um, as I said, the process at the beginning, they were like substituting tents immediately, but then UNSR wanted to plan this. Um, and this, the, the, product, the um, introduction of caravans into the camp space has created a whole new dynamics into like this kind of process of negotiation between space and the caravan as a building unit. So people were like, okay, we want to stay here because we know our relatives in this place, but at the same time, caravans, we cannot move. So they were like trying to find ways in which they can move this new, let's say, shelter unit. Um, they were putting um, gas cylinders beneath the, the caravans, they were putting pla um, metal um, plates, all kind of means to, to move this um, new structure, um, which in my um, research and the whole camp appears like um, at some point the caravans somehow materialized this, they, they, they were like poured into the social structure and the social networks, they kind of absorbed the, the caravans and they um, created what I will explain later, this urban environment of the camp. But at the same time, the, the planning of caravans at different parts of the camp also attracted social kind of networks to, to emerge around them and create new places. So this is somehow related to the social distribution and allocation of people within the camp, which is very much um, different from what happened in Palestinian camps and also the, the work of uh, Julie Petit and, and other people. Okay, so there was this interesting moment when people received the caravans and the tents. And um, this probably lies very much on the understanding of, of urban informality and the writing of Asif Bayat who talks that informality is the, you know, it happens when this moment of dignity of the people push them to actually take action, so they have to do something. So when people were living in these tents, of course families living in one caravans, um, many people were like complaining about this condition where they had to live all, like the whole family have to live in one, one space and they were like, this is a shame, we, we never used to live in this situation before. Um, many people also consider this like a humiliation where they had to, you know, with, with elderly woman, for example, or, or mother or grandmother living with, the, with them, they had to take all the time to, um, to the communal infrastructure. So they were like somehow starting to slowly disapprove this communality, the imposed communality of this infrastructure that was, um, um, let's say, imposed by UNHCR planning paradigms. Um, so they slowly started to create this hybrid shelter, so a, a mixture between caravans and tents started to, to emerge. And this guy was very, he was very glad about this, um, what he made here, like a, uh, he made a small, a small um, semi-private space for, for receiving guests and also a place for, um, for chickens and also like a small toilet. And he was so happy with the toilet, he was like, yeah, this is a Turkish toilet. And I didn't understand what that is, but um, obviously, the, 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 this moment was like um, interesting because it's a, it was an opportunity for people to create um, things that they did not, they were not able to have in, in Syria before. Um, and at the same time, as I mentioned, this has resulted into the deterioration of this infra infrastructure that was implemented or let's say imposed by UNHCR as common. For example, the, the, the toilets and the um, yeah, common latrines, as you see here. And eventually, of course, UNHCR has to, now they, they, dissolved all, they dismantled all the communal latrines because they didn't work anymore and they, they implemented a sewage system, which is, um, of course, something interesting I will explain later. So, um, as I said, UNHCR, they, when, when the donation of caravans started very slowly at the beginning, UNHCR transformed this into a policy. So they said, okay, we will substitute all tents with caravans within the camp. So slowly the, the camp started to 
create what was men mentioned by one of the newspaper as a massive park for caravans, so parking place for caravans. So they were like just a collection of caravans expanding on a size of a city. Um, and as people started to slowly create space and place around them, so they were, as you see here, like, um, of course, these, these um, images are not shared. I, I, I have to take them from, uh, use my Photoshop skills to take them from <laughs> UNOSAT, rep UNOSAT reports. But they show this kind of transformation that occurred, as I see here, as you see here, like from the planning towards uh, a very complex environment, which seems to be worth understanding for us, especially as architects. Um, um, this one is in two years. Yes, in two years. Right. Um, so, as I said, the people tried to, they started to, to create homes out of what they had. So they had they started to, to get these caravans and they connect them together and they created these spaces. And this process was very much um, driven also by, by acts of solidarity. So people were like, Okay, we, we found here like some um, rain pipe installed by one NGO. We took it, we just cut it, we connected it with each other. We had each other to create this. Uh, and we, when, when we, of course, they created this sewage system and they connected to the rain uh, pipe, which was like very dramatic for NGOs to, to hear about because they had their understanding of how things should work. And people were like, like well, they were not so like, satisfied with that. Um, the interesting fact about this, the same, the same thing that I'm showing here is this as well, which is the, the reproduction of this social structures. So the people were like, interesting this moment is that the space was instructed by the social understanding of how life should be, how, the, how urbanity should look like. So, um, so this, was, there was, this also marked the transformation from this open, closed, um, binary of space and this normative understanding of, of unit CR, there was this um, diversities of spaces between the public and the semi-public and semi-private and private. So this place, is, um, you know, you can access it here, you have to go a little bit down because they, they, they put like all the water tanks in here, you have to go inside and it's composed of these seven um, houses. They um, of course, they created also front yards and backyards, and also they reproduced this, as I said, the social kind of structures they used to have. For example, number four is a house of a, the son of a Mukhtar and, and Dara'a who were like saying, okay, we used to have the Madafa, which is a guest house. Um, and he reprodu reproduced this Madafa again. So he, he put it here in, this, in the semi private space, inviting his friends and the relatives. So they were sitting all the time, men there, and they were like inviting me for food. And I'm so excited that I like their. Uh, I think it's called something from Dara cuisine. I don't know, um, but, but I mean, I mean, this is um, interesting how people reproduce these spaces and also how um, how for 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 unit CR and for people who work in humanitarian organization, these spaces are just a collection of caravans. Whereas this is a very complex urban environment, also f challenging for architects to understand how people make these kind of um, um, arrangements. Uh, for example, as you see, this is like a house number seven and also number one, and they have these spaces in between where they put the water tanks and they kind of, because this is the only main street here, you know, for the, for the water tanks, so they extended them over the buildings of each other and they tried to um, manage within the situation they have. This is uh, how it looks like um, from the inside, also people installing, you know, um, swings for their kids and all that. And I find also this very interesting. Um, it's um, again, that's the house of the son of the Mukhtar. And he, I was asking him, like, I was asking him, what is this exactly? And he was like, yeah, this is my mother. She always built this every day, but the kids, they keep, you know, they play with the pole and they destroy it every time. And she keeps building this again. So this is like for her, like a place where she's always sitting outside and socializing with people. And I think this is, very interesting thing because this kind of small details they somehow appear, disappearing in our understanding of of how we when we design houses for the cities you know um, how people actually use space in this um, um, to socialize um, as I said so this process of homemaking and placemaking also were, were accompanied with the production of Hara as a concept so people were like 
Uh, of course, this is very challenging in a, human, in a humanitarian setting when you say this is a temporal place, this is a camp, you cannot have haras. What is a hara? So people, the solidarity of people, they, they produced all kind of, they reproduced actually all kind of um, urban um, uh, characteristics which are, of course, not understandable in a humanitarian understanding. For example, vegetable shop, um, um, you know, like they, how they manage all these kind of um, structures. And I tried, um, um, in 2014, I tried to map for this cluster, like, what, 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 what are the boundaries of the Hara? And one of the guys, he was, he was very proud, he was like, yeah, the whole camp is my neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I think he was also challenged by the question of where, where is this starting and ending. So he was like, okay, the whole camp is my Hara. Um, so, um, these housing, as I said, the, the, for example, this uh, cluster, the people who, are, who, who, who live in this cluster come from different parts from Syria. Um, and this has um, resulted in different housing typologies, of course, uh, to which people attached economic activities and they created small shops. Um, and the creation of, of homes, of course, they always, they always like um, process of putting two caravans next to each other, creating a court and then enclose it. And it was very um, interesting question for me to ask, so how do you make your home? So how did you reach this process? What did you do? So they were like, okay, we put this here, we put this here, we close it. And then it was interesting because when people said, when we close it, it's a home. So they were like, this, this process of, very interesting, this, this um, home making uh, implies the process of including diversity and um, enclosure, which is very much not a presence in the, in the the, the one space shelter, you know, like you have one space that's expecting to exclude, to include everything, which is actually not, it's excluding everything. The blues, right? yeah, exactly, the blue are the caravans and also sometimes red, but these reds are used for economic activities, yeah. Um, so these, um, again, these housing typologies, of course, this is work in process, but this is like something that's, um, um, different and uh, it has its own the typologies in different parts of the camp. For example, the oldest parts they produce something that looks like an informal settlement. It's very complex and dense, whereas in other places, you know, you could found like one home. Uh, it's, it's very spiritous and sometimes linear structure. So people um, also it's interesting how economy played a role in this. So they were like, for example, if they lacked the uh, means to buy caravans. They were like connecting these caravans next to each other. So in one part of the camp, they produce these linear structures where you can see, you know, houses, um, um, yeah, exactly, linear structures based on um, economic needs. Um, another aspect when, during this process of homemaking and, and placemaking is these um, special tactics and strategies that people created and also the way social relations were able to specialize and materialize itself into the space of the camp. For example, um, one of the families, of course, they came to the camp with a tent and then they get a, ca a caravan donated by someone and then the brother came from Syria, so he was like settling next to them and then, of course, the camp, the, they were try trying to develop home next in this place. So it's interesting how these social dynamics also, as I said, they specialize themselves. They, they, they actually um, influence the, the, the home in which this is very difficult to happen in a, in a city where you have, you know, you have very rigid structure that sometimes doesn't accommodate this very dynamic social relations um, exactly that, that were um, poss possible to take place in the camp. For example, at the end, you see the, the, the houses, there was one caravan that was donated and then the one house where all the females remained, of course, the single male here they were like deported back to Syria, um, which created something. I don't know if, if you could recognize what is this. Uh, no, no. So this is like a, a toilet. This is like a toilet. This is a house that was dismantled. So it's interesting how the camp, like all these kind of social dynamics, um, as I said, occur in the camp, but the camp could be read as archaeological site. So you can look at the, all these details that could um, explain the different movements and, and dynamics that were taking place in the camp. Um, another interesting aspect is this, how people tried to manage these in-between spaces that started to result as, a, as the homemaking, of course, developed. And um, 
many of people, many of the people, of course, they were trying to manage these small places or close them or even, as I said, put them as a storeroom for for shell for um, water tanks and other other material. Um, um, uh, uh, so another interesting aspect I found very much really exciting, which is this um, um, washing lines. Of, oh wow! Uh, um, so this is also showing how people negotiate the relationship between each other. So when you see this, this is um, something that um, people use. Of course, I have now I have to run. Okay, so. Um, um, again, I'm trying to to make to make I'm trying to visualize all these relations into um, these few drawings I'm making for this IFPA exhibition in Amman actually next week. Um, so I'm trying to put all these small small details that people use to actually create space. So, for example, the washing lines here. If you look at this as a cluster, you would realize that people they made a very narrow entry to this to this area. Of course, this is the main street. Everything else is blocked. For example, they blocked here. To, to make a storeroom, they also added different details here, like a water tank, like a washing line, to make this also like not easily accessible. So it's interesting how people start to structure the space according to their to how do they use it, um, which is as you see here. Um, as I said, this is the only entry. This was also like a moment where people were actually building. Um, building houses they did not let me of course take a picture of this but i have to make a small sketch i will show you um, so um about the, the the caravans of course the caravans were donated from different parts uh, definitely gulf regions mainly so kuwait oman but also other um, the donors from some south asia um, each of these caravans um, had its own price for example based on its quality for for, for example the omani uh, is much better than Saudi. Of course, Saudi is like low, lower quality. Um, I don't know. So, so um, interest, another, another interesting aspect is this kind of emerging ter ter territoriality of the camp, which is um, very much uh, striking for humanitarian organizations, which have a very understanding of the district, which is one, two, three, four. Now the camp is um, based on districts, but. Um, people used, I think, in my opinion, people use this naming to somehow to hand to, to political issues because they kind of dropped off all the other um, donors, which um, from from South Asia, for example, that has no relation to the Syrian crisis. Um, so, as I said, the, the caravan became the DNA of the camp. So, what happened afterwards is that people they they started to dismantle the caravan and, re and reconnecting the caravans in different ways. Um, and they became very, now, now there's a kind of new architecture practice that's emerging in the camp, which I think um, this needs to be understood and, and uh, explored more. So each of these parts of the caravan has its own price and the people try to connect them together. So also connecting um, these caravans to, 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 their, to, to the economy of homes. And it was a very interesting question I had to ask people many times. So if you have this empty space, why don't you expand? Why don't you have like a, your dream house they were like, this is, this is expensive. We cannot just expand because it's available. So it's interesting how this um, homemaking process somehow um, um, included this proportions, this understanding of proportionality, propo uh, like the scales exactly of, uh, of um, economy and, and um, social relations. As I said here, like I made a sketch where people, they were like, um, they use uh, gas, empty gas cylinders and, and ladder to lift up and move the caravans so also it's interesting how the caravans um, this is uh, of course a new project where the units are started to settle the houses and they created this address system so each house you know now is located in the street so they have for example here Shara al khail but it's interesting that people don't care about this actually so they use this and they put it here upstairs to to create you know to to make an entrance we don't we don't care about the names now um, um, another interesting thing is um, this emerging, as I said, emerging building culture uh, that's very much interested by the caravan as a, also as a um, unit that's influenced by sounds. For example, one guy, we were sitting in the caravan, he was like, you know, you can hear these guys, this is how we, we, we hear, you know, it's, it's very, very light, uh, of course, structure, so you, have to, you can hear other people. And it's interesting how this also influenced the, the process in which people arranged their houses based on um, you know this 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 new structure. Um, finally, I'm trying to come to conclusion. So um, 
Yes, so exactly. So um, I also asked people to um, to draw sometimes their, their original houses where they used to live in Syria. And it's very interesting because it's very diverse. People think, or there is a kind of um, um, a common understanding that people reproduce actually the houses where they came from. But I think this is um, very... Um, not true because this is a you know this homemaking was an opportunity to actually use memory but also to create new things which people could not actually have in Syria for example as I said one of the guys he was living in an old house in, in Damascus whereas others were living in rural houses um, and a collection actually of houses and extended houses house extended family house in, in Dara or, or in Homs uh, and also other places um, finally to um, to explain so Units are, they have this um, a mapping they did in 2013 about where actually these people come from. So there was like, these, this um, distribution was understood as, you know, where, according to governorate, so Stanamein, Dara, Isra. So you have these three easy going, um, um, you know, groups. Whereas when I was trying to understand this kind of ethnographic distribution of people, it seems that this micro identities that were actually um, very evident, evident during the, the research um, and while in, in Palestinian camps this process happened according to you know where people come from so they reproduces they re, sorry in Palestinian camps they reproduced you know the, city, the districts based on the cities where they came from so you have Haifa, Yaffa etc in a Palestinian camp um, here this distinction was not so clear but there was like also um, uh, the separation between the Bedou and Hadar. So they were like understanding the Bedou as the other, you know? So they were like living here and they were like at the beginning and then um, because of their lifestyle, you know, they have kids walking in the streets naked and they were like, we cannot accept this, this is like not how we live. So they were expelled to the emptiest part of the camp, which is this, this part. And then the interesting aspect is this, how these um, social identities also appear in the production of, of homes and places. For example, if you see this, this part of the camp, um, people relied very much on, on plastic sheets. These are like Bedouin houses, actually. One of the guys from Damascus, he was like, yeah, okay, you can of course know them because they use lots of plastic sheets when they make create the homes. Whereas this is, for example, a house of a guy from Damascus who wanted to reproduce you know, the, the, the lifestyle he had. Um, and others actually, of course, used this as opportunity. For example, this guy here, he was like very, very proud about this kitchen. He was like, this American kitchen. I, of course, these are all... Um, um, uh, wooden plates taken from the flooring of the caravan, so they took it out and they cut it and they um, remodeled it. Um, finally, uh, so what culture are we talking about? So before I was, um, when I was doing this research at the beginning in 2014, I was very much, um, I thought that this was like a, the organization of the camp was driven by this Syrian culture, but it, obviously there is a, a new culture that's actually emerging in the camp, which is a hybrid one resulting from this different identities that are mixing inside the camp. Um, and I still remember actually one of the interviews I had with a, actually a discussion with a, with a little kid in a Nazarak camp and she was like, yeah, everyone talks to me with, with one accent, I reply with it, you know, you talk my Dara'awi So, um, yes, so this is interesting how this new hybrid cultures are emerging and of course, finally, I just want to say that because people were actually able to create their own space, there is lots of feelings of belonging within these camps. One of the ladies, she was like telling me, uh, So she was like, I go outside the camp a little bit and then I'm like really yearning to come back to the camp. And this is interesting because these social relations had, um, you know, um, created this sense of belonging. Finally, to conclude, um, um, I will make conclusion on Zatari and then probably something to think about for the social agenda. So, uh, yeah. So refugees have taken the lead, of course, in creating the city, which is respond to so sociocultural needs. Uh, being the architects, the organization of the camp was the process of daily negotiation between space, materials, and social dynamics. Being the planner, refugees articulated a form of a city, an architecture that's disappearing under the pressures of political and economic agendas. Um, finally, for, for, for the sake of the panel, I think social agendas are dynamic and include multiple layers and levels of culture, social groups, networks, identities, and their politics. Um, in my opinion, embracing social agendas and architectural design means facilitating socio-spatial nego negotiations. 
and social agendas do not always have the loudest voice. So I think it's interesting because it resonates with yesterday's lecture that probably we need to work with other disciplines like ethnography and anthropology to understand um, how social dynamics occur. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, very stimulating conversations. I'll start with a few comments on my own before opening it up to the floor. So um, I'll start with the beginning, uh, with the first presentation, with some questions uh, to Tahar, and then uh, I'll move on with the rest. I'll try to more than five minutes. Okay, so um, the mic. Up, so I don't know. Okay. Well, these are some thoughts uh, from the presentation. Um, I was, I wanted to to check um, how would you account for Carol for the potential violence, I would say, of the banal, especially in, in a context like Beirut, which where inequalities are very much materialized in urban space, uh, and where uh, also, I would say, patriarchal uh, conflicts, tensions, are also very much present in that public space. So I wonder if you reflected on that, because at some point, and I think you mentioned it, and I'd like you maybe to go back to it and elaborate on that. I felt that there is some gaze that one feels on these spaces of the vague, the banal, the terrain vague, that might elude the inner tensions and uh, uh, conflicts and maybe exclusions that happen in this space. So how not to romanticize these spaces? You mentioned it at some point that this is one pot potential trap and how to, um, to um, because I think what it's coming from, is from the experience of Beirut, often what we are terming banal or, or terrain vague are territories that are very much classed, that are for the poor, they're uh, abandoned, they're underutilized, and I also see them very much as spaces that are, that represent and materialize the dysfunctional state. This is a, these are spaces without any services. These are spaces that are sub-rented sometimes, squatted, especially in Bashura, and very contested. So uh, I feel that somewhere these, all these uh, politics in these spaces, when we gaze at them and uh, I would say romanticize them as you, as the the literature does often. It's not only you uh, elude that. And how can we, as architects, urbanists who are thinking about these spaces and intervening on them, do that? How do you do it with your interventions work? So that would be a, a first question for you. Um, yeah, and the, and the sub point on. Um, uh, I think the importance of also placing that overall reflection not only in Bashura, given there are so many of those spaces all over the city. And um, uh, I feel that looking only at Bashura tends to, for people who would not know the city, think that this is the only space left. And I think there are in Beirut, also thanks to the dysfunctionality of the state, a lot of these spaces, what did you call them? The cities of the uh, the dwellers, the lift spaces, the appropriated spaces. Um, I'll move on with the, Ralph. I'll just throw these to you and then maybe open it up. And we can have conversations about this later, but I thought that this might stir conversations as well with the audience. Um, I, was, I, I, th I thought that both your presentations, Ralph and I, have had so many intersections that I found this fascinating that there's somewhere where menus or tools of intervention on the city are being done by your practice and then here we have uh, humanitarian agencies that come and give very different sets of menus based on very different sets of uh, assumptions and that are completely circum I mean taken uh, into different meanings by the people themselves who become architects as well so I thought that was something very interesting between both your talks. An architect that 
tries to give voice to people and become architects of their own space but giving, by giving them materials, uh, potential ways of working with this material. And here, architects themselves dis deconstructing caravans and creating these materials through which they, they can combine new spaces. So I thought these two conversations are very interesting and I hope that we can reflect on th these intersections together as well. Um, my, my question to you, Ralph, was more because you, you talked a lot about the fact that you talk with the future dwellers that are going to inhabit these spaces. And for me, this is fascinating. In a city where we have so much real estate speculation, where all ap our apartment buildings are half empty, if not more, who are the dwellers? How can we engage them in the city? How does this link to neoliberal architecture and urbanism where the dweller is like we assume a user of that space versus what you're doing where you're working with that user of that space so if you can tell us some more about that context that would be very useful too um, I am I think I, uh, it's uh, so interesting what you presented I'm not going to go in the detail of it uh, as such I think it's so rich we can talk about it forever but I think we need to say this to the audience the refugee crisis is a crisis of camps, as you said, there are a lot of camps in the region, but it's also an urban crisis. At, in Lebanon, for instance, we had a no-camp policy, so that we have, we don't call them tan, uh, camps, we call them ITSs, informal tented settlements, but it's also predominantly an urban crisis. So an urban situation where refugees come and live in the city. And I think we should not again fall in the trap of romanticizing these architectural spatial practices that you presented in Zaatari as if this is the right solution to how we should live with uh, how refugees should be. They are so inventive, so creative, and we start again gazing on these practices. And I think it, we need to, I'm sure you have done that in your lit review as a PhD candidate. I'm sure you're working with Philip, right? That I'm sure he made you read all this stuff on the camps. But uh, I think it's important to replace the discussion on the um, on the camp as an excluded space, as a space that is hors la ville, that is completely outside of the city, and what does this mean to urbanity and urban life? So I'll end with that. I took a bit more than I should have, so I saw you. So uh, people who want to speak, please raise your hands and we'll have a mic go around. We'll try to take, I would say, a first round of three questions before I give the floor to the panelists so they can respond a bit. I'm really sorry, but I'm also sure there are so many here who want to talk. City Debates is a collection of moments where we can talk a lot among each other as well. So this is not just restricted to that. And if the organizers permit, we can extend the discussion, but that's up to you. Should we? No? Yes. So uh, Dr. Sikkar and the person behind after. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, um, I would like uh, to pass my question mainly to uh, Ayham. Um, and following up uh, from what uh, Professor Harp uh, said about um, the thinking of uh, the camps and your uh, asking for us to think critically about them. If we think about them from outside, uh, in a places outside Lebanon, like uh, the place in Zaatari itself, um, if you start the journey again, do you think <coughs> that it's uh, helpful to leave the space uh, and the opportunity for people to design their places, to be architects? Or do you think that uh, uh, it, it has been good, uh, or, or would you uh, design uh, the camps in the future in a way to, uh, to start from where you have uh, reached now? Uh, so uh, this is a question of uh, how we allow people to be architects uh, uh, for themselves, and uh, whether uh, um, we should not really interfere interfere in such a uh, situation. Also, I have a very simple, quick question: uh, What is the future of Zaatari camp in Jordan? Uh, would it really be uh, turning into a city, or it can't happen? I know this is a cliche question, but I think it is re related to the first question. Thanks. Uh, 
uh, thanks for three very interesting talks that are really interesting, I think, in relationship to one another. Uh, one thing that comes up in my mind out of the three is the use of spatial ethnography, which in some ways you all took into account. Um, and then, in some ways, the sort of creation of parables, in your case, Carol, and the creation of actually auto-constructed spaces, in your case, Rolf, and probably in your case, I am the production of studies or research and scholarship. And it reminds me that in ethnographic work, we don't explicitly make clear who our audiences are. And maybe in traditional ethnography, that's always other scholars. But it seems to me when you do spatial ethnography, you also have to think about the audiences that you're constructing or creating with your work. And I'd be interested to hear each of you think about what other kinds of audiences you might want for the work you've created, and whether or not that could make those studies effective in some ways that otherwise might not be so clear. Uh, my question to Ayham, uh, he mentioned that the importance of anthropology. So you didn't highlight uh, in the background of these refugees, the background I mean the profession before they came to Zatari camp. A lot of Syrians in rural communities, they are builders, they are uh, work in uh, mechanics or carpenters, so they, they know how to manage themselves, they know how to build themselves. Before, even in Syria, they built their buildings before. So after they transferred or to Zahtari camp, all of these professions also uh, were brought in inside the camp. So why you didn't highlight about the backgrounds of those refugees? Hello. Thank you again. Um, my question is related to uh, the contrast that we see between, uh, or uh, what we, in your presentations, uh, what we see between the spontaneity that, uh, that has happened in uh, Zatari camp and the one we see in, uh, in Beirut with you, Carol, and the banalité that becomes uh, something and the empty spaces that become an opportunity to build something or to do something about them. Could it be something at, in, a, in an empty uh, building or a negative space? Okay, uh, And we see that in, in uh, Zatari camp where these empty spaces are invested by uh, the new occupants. Uh, then I come to the Netherlands uh, example where everything is rational and it's there. There's no place for something that is uh, uh, spontaneous. And uh, the, this becomes anonymous as a space. And you said that in your presentation. I want to see how this, uh, this approach in, in designing could become more spontaneous. Later on, I think someone will, will talk about the favelas. Uh, from which we learn a lot in design and architecture today. So how do you treat this space? Um, this is a question for you, because this is very interesting how to transform an anonymous, an anonymous space into something that's more personal and more, uh, more uh, living, flexible. sure it's working and just don't know how to make it work um, I don't know where to start um, well the first question the, the easiest question to answer is your second question Mona why why only Bashura when there are so many other places uh, that would fit the similar descriptions in terms of how people inhabit and who's inhabiting and all this is really that this kind of documentation requires a whole lot of time um, and effort. There are things that I didn't show, like I, I, I taught um, the art classes for the, the classes of the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade 
um, classes at, at the at the pri at the public school. Um, I mean, there, there was so many things. So of if I had stayed in Lebanon, um, maybe I would have moved to a different neighborhood and done a similar thing so that we can begin and maybe not quite as in-depth because I needed to spend all this time in order to get my head around what was going on. Not being from Lebanon, I had to learn all these things about... Um, I had to learn all these things about uh, who's who, who's doing what, who who thinks how, and you know, um, so that that required a lot of time of and effort for me. Um, that these things might not transpire in at least not in the presentation today, um, but I think I was I was very well aware of the of the danger of the. Um, not that I ever felt in danger, but I could see it and sense it, that it was a potential thing. Um, about the surveillance, being followed by mopeds, guys on mopeds, and being asked not to take pictures. And uh, But because I went there um, often, uh, eventually I became like the strange white woman who comes and does things that we don't know what she's doing. And also because I worked with the kids at school, then I think the word eventually got around that it was okay that I was there. So eventually people would kind of nod, say hello, and not that I, I, I didn't become part of the neighborhood, but I think I was, I was tolerated and it was okay. Um, when I would go with a student um, to help me document certain things, then this uh, surveillance became very, very real, where people would come up to his face, like literally, and ask, what's your name, where are you from, what building did you grow up in, on what street, and so it was very, um, the tension was very real. So in the work uh, that I presented briefly, um, well, in the book, I do talk about this. Uh, I, there's a much longer description of Bashura, and I don't think that someone reading the book would think that this is what Beirut is like. I think I make it very specific that it is this pocket that's been kept outside of the general discourse. And because it's uh, of its proximity to the downtown area, I think this is what makes it, the, to me, the the most obvious example of how there's this dichotomy with different places, but because it, it's right there next to Solidar, it's like mind-blowing that these two extremities exist next to each other. Um, so I, I hope, I made an effort, I really hope not to romanticize this and look at it as a, as a Bolarian kind of, oh, this is so, you know, whatever. Um, I think that but I think that one needs to, to build a representation of it so that we begin to, to trigger an interest, um, a genuine interest for how things operate, how people live. And being a foreigner, I think, uh, allowed me to, to have access to certain things that, for example, the students that came with me didn't because they were confronted with the political affiliation and all of these, where because I'm foreign, I'm abstracted from this, and people would invite me for coffee in their house. They would, so they didn't see me as a, as a political figure, um, but really as someone who was interested in their lives. So it, it kind of shifted um, their own responses to my presence. So whether it's a good or a bad thing, I don't know, but it, that's my experience of it. I've forgotten all the other questions. <laughs> Another three hours ago. <laughs> let, me, let me answer the easy one uh, first, the one uh, you were asking, uh, how do we know the future residents? Um, by knowing them, and by knowing them personally. So that, that is also, that, that brings the critique of this approach with it because the scaling factor is very limited. We had that discussion yesterday with the, within your lecture, which I recognized immediately the problem, no? Yes, you can deal with groups of maybe 60 to 80 people, but we need like 60,000 to 80,000, or even 600,000 to 800,000. Come on, this is not a valuable strategy. Um, Obviously, I don't agree with that. 
theory, but uh, because I think um, exemplary projects can have, and I've noticed that in South America, where we worked a lot in the favela context, actually, um, where things kick off something that kind of has a multiplying effect in itself without you having to do it. And that would be the ideal uh, situation, of course. Um, so how do we know them? Um, that was a tricky part, um, very um, personal. Um, we knew what was going on in 2015. Um, we knew there were one million people. We didn't know how to address them, where to find them. Absurd situation, uh, totally paradox. And um, we talked to our president of the university and um, we set up a program to invite students from uh, Damascus, from Homs, from Kabul, wherever, to take part in the courses at TU, to be part of them. So there we had a very personal entry that immediately was not about um, issues like where you're from, or it was like, okay, we have a project, we have a, a design task. Now we work together on a design task and we try to solve it and let's see how far we get it. And out of this understanding, we get to know more people and more and the whole thing is kind of building up. So this is a process that was not orchestrated within a couple of weeks. You know, this is like three years now and it's ongoing. It's uh, exactly, yeah, and that is very important. For example, in the last one we're building, we're 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 uh, working on now this place of this little greenhouse look like thing. This space it's just an empty space, really. Um, that it has an address in a mental map. It's the place where the people that are interested in living in that project come and get information. They, there are certain activities being organized with them to get to know each other. Um, we kind of um, direct the thing a little bit also according to their skills they bring along. Obviously we need certain group of people as well that you know are willing to, to live there and build it, uh, to build up a, a little community. Um, well, all this has has a sort of a, a, a first phase, which is not architecture, literally speaking, but which has a, which is setting the framework in which the architecture can be generated at all. No, so it's like the the research before the the activities before, um, and that is something. Uh, now I try to to make a, a bridge to <laughs> to you, your comment because. Pff, Having worked in South America, I know that the understanding of the public space and, and common spaces in Europe is probably very, very different to many other parts in the world, um, since there is a very deep understanding or conviction, let's say, goes without saying, no, it's how it always was, that the home is your private thing, as long as you're not affecting any other one, you more or less, uh, this sort of down that line, you, know, you, you can do what you want. So simply said, what you're doing inside the building is up to you, what you're doing outside the building, hang on a minute. Because we have to look at that thing you're doing there. No, So we have commissions, we have rules, uh, we have regulations, totally over-regulated, I agree, No, but um, that are only busy with the effect on the public realm, on the public space. And I keep, I, the, the moment you said it, I actually think it's, it would be a wonderful PhD to kind of look into why a traditional city, a Dutch city, which is like tiny, picturesque, um, terrible for any personal interaction, to be honest. Um, the public space is very limited, squeezed, you know, it doesn't allow for much. But it's, it feels like somehow you belong there, and these buildings, they have big spaces in between. You could play football, whatever, you know. Um, they evoke the opposite, actually. So something between the perception of space and the actual feeling that I can do something there, I can appropriate that space, I can whatever. There's a paradox there, and I'm, I'm, to be honest, I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. But even though um, in that context, 
like transforming spaces is always something that go comes from without the need uh, the, the use of the space so not so less about what it's going to look like or whether it's physically there readable from the outside but um, it, it's got to be functioning from within first and then comes the second layer we negotiate once we're there um, how far can we push it you know these extensions for example um, how far can we push it into the in, into the pathway, into the green space, or you know, then you're dealing with other parties, with the city, and with the office for green spaces and the office for infrastructure, and uh, well, I spare you the details, but you're on a different level, no, on a different negotiation level. So, and the only ch uh, chance you have is building up slowly from a very personal. That was the idea, no, from a very iterative uh, moment one after the other you know first the trousers then the shoes not the other way around well that sort of idea it just like let it grow because one thing that was clearly visible there is that everyone had the feeling i'm only one i cannot do anything i'm like who am i but all of a sudden they realized there's 600 offices or activities needing a space hey if we put this together in a letter sending to the mayor he's going to be in big trouble no so all of a sudden they start organizing themselves and claiming that space and, and all of a sudden there's also empty spaces no they get oh yeah why don't you start here we don't need it you can have it for five years and then we see you know you, you even get it for free you know can pay back if it's a success it will pay back if not you you're going to be gone as all businesses are which are not you know and somebody else taken over so. Um, um, thank you very much for the comments and the questions. Um, just to comment shortly on, I think um, what you Mona mentioned, this um, intersectionality between the different presentations is highlighting. I think in my two, two, two points that we need to always to take into consideration. The first one is the positionality. I think this is not yet, not enough explored in the urban architectural field, which is the positionality of the person, of the of the architect in, in the moment in the, in the moment of producing space and also at the same time positionality of the spaces within the matrix of urban you know very dynamic world in which we live um, so I think also this is answering somehow um, Ahmad's question this is uh, it's very difficult to say which 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 modes of production is the best one for making a camp or not I think it's a uh, um, as I said this um, mm, yeah, of course, there's a, it's better not to make war. This is absolutely the right answer. But um, yeah, but, but basically, as I said, I'm interested in this, as I said, this, this positionality of the architect within this context, and also the importance of the context, as you said, the difference between how the camp was managed by the people directly, whereas in a, for example, European context, the state wants to actually provide the service still today. So um, how the context actually influenced this positionality is something very interesting, I think, I think in my opinion. Um, about the audience, um, the question of the audience, I think um, this is a very um, valid question, and it's, uh, um, in my case, it would be the, probably the humanitarian organizations, which which um, I had once, one, uh, I was also presenting, and there was one guy from UNCR, he was like very offended by what I was saying. But at the same time, I think um, it's, it's maybe difficult to romanticize that everyone wants actually to listen to what, I mean, I, I think that probably, I, I mean, for myself, um, as a you know researcher, to speak truth to power, it's not like my intention to please the, you, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, um, exactly. So, um, coming to your question about um, background and ethnography, it's a very good one. Um, the background of the people, of course, many of the people, it's like it has right now 80,000 um, persons living there. Mm, of course, most of them come, came from rural areas, but not all. And not all of them are handy or like really as creative as we imagine them to be. So I think, 
Of course, some of the people who used to produce houses took the initiative to actually do that, but it's now a complete business somehow emerging and running into the camp. You know, if you have some problem, you would call someone, electric, electrician or, you know, a realtor who will, like, manage, you know, situation. So, um, yeah, exactly. So, um, so the background helped, but uh, it's interesting how it developed also afterwards. Yes. Uh, the session ends at 12:30, so we're five miles. But uh, I mean, you're the boss, so you you can take more time from the lunch break, or okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for being here. We resume at 2 p.m. with a keynote lecture. Please join me in uh, thanking our speakers uh, and an announcement after. The